Hello everybody and welcome to today's Scrum Pulse. My name's Dave West, I am the CEO here at Scrum.org and I will be the host and compare uh, for today's proceedings. And um, this webinar is particularly personal for me. So uh, in a moment I'll share a little bit of context for why this, this webinar is so important. Uh, but first I'll get some housekeeping things uh, underway. So uh, Sally, can you move on to the next slide please? So a few quick guidelines for today's uh, today's go-to webinars. I'm sure you're familiar with because you've probably been to other webinars. But your microphones will be muted, and that's as you hear in the background as one of my children is screaming as we're all locked down here at home in in Massachusetts, and I'm sure you are around the world. Uh, your microphones will be muted, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't ask questions. In fact, uh, we actively encourage it. Now, there's two ways you can ask uh, questions. One is to use the question box. Um, as you can see there, you can enter your question and um, we can respond to it. Um, or we, I'll call it out and ask Sally um, as, as we go through the presentation. I'll, I'll bring them up as, as relevant. Uh, we may not get to every question. If we don't, we'll, we'll um, maybe come back to you with particular answers if it's impossible. The other way to ask a question is using the, the webinar comments box. Now, remember that um, you can comment to everybody. You can comment to me. You can comment to um, the organizer support. Um, you can you, you can direct these things. So if you want everybody to see it though, you have to do it to, to everybody. So anyway, so these are the two ways that you can you can ask questions. Um, Sally, can we move to the to the next slide, please? So this is a Scrum Pulse. Um, the, this is our webinar series. And for the people that don't know Scrum.org, and maybe there's a few people on that have never that never been or know Scrum.org, you know that we are the home of Scrum. We have 330 trainers around the world delivering virtual classes at the moment because many of them are locked down, as I'm sure you are. We also offer the certifications supporting them, uh, but you obviously don't need to go on a training class to get the certifications. Now, it was started by Ken Schwaber, the co-creator of Scrum, um, I, I now run scrum.org for him and we are the sort of body of knowledge so please you know jump onto scrum.org have a look at, um, at the at the website etc um, now before we start I just really want to set some some context because I, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Sally and of the work that she's been doing and the ideas that she's been sharing with our community and uh, and the the neurodiversity or ADHD uh, community at large. And the reason why I'm a big fan is, is a personal one. So my son suffers from ADHD and uh, uh, he is dyslexic and has ADHD. Now what's interesting about the challenges that we I see with him is that I never really thought about using Scrum, which is obviously a huge part of my life to help to help him. The other thing that's really illustrative at the moment in the times that we are at is the world's upside down. There's no excuses for that. There's no pretense. You know, my kids are not in school, including um, uh, my son, George, who, who, who suffers from ADHD. It, the world is absolutely confusing. I don't know what's next. I don't know what's happening. You know, our business is, has changed to a virtual one. Our uh, life is very different. I'm no longer going to an office or traveling to conferences. Now, what's interesting is that this complexity that I see is probably how George and many people that suffer from ADHD see the world every day. You know, one of the great things about Scrum is that it's provided us with a foundation in a complex world. It's provided us with this little set of guardrails to help us deal with complexity. Now, I was made aware of the work that Sally and others were doing around the use of Scrum in the home, as we're calling this, um, about three, 2018, October, uh, one of our PSTs, Steve Trapps, wrote a blog that caught my attention. He then went on to write several more. I then reached out to Sally and started talking to her about this. I'm really excited to, to introduce Sally and the work that she's doing. Sally, can you put the next slide to actually say who you are, please? Yeah. I'm really excited to be sharing this with the community because Scrum, yeah, it can help you build fantastic software products, right? 
<laughs> it can help you build drugs. It can help you build cars. We see that at Tesla. Spaceships, we see that at SpaceX, right? But ultimately, the real benefit of Scrum is helping people deal with complexity. And if it can help you in your home, and if it can help you better manage your life and make people happier and deliver more value, then it's it's a fantastic thing. So Sally uh, has been working on this for a while um, and been doing stuff that she's going to share today. Um, as you can see, she uh, has spoken multiple times. She's a developer so obviously her and I have things that we can talk about and connect with which is which is great and that's where she she learned scrum if you uh, there's going to be a number of ways to contact everybody after today if you need any help if you need you know a, a shoulder to cry on Phil there's going to be lots of ways to connect so without further ado I'd like to uh, to hand over to you Sally and welcome you to today's Scrum Pulse, and I really am excited to hear you share the story that I've heard a little bit about with the, the broader community. Sally. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, it is absolutely thrilling to be here, um, and it's so strange to be sitting at home and knowing that I'm talking to so many people. So, uh, yeah, here goes. So, basically, I'd like to start by uh, running a little bit of a thought experiment. Um, so, a little kid and the main thing that you know about yourself is that you annoy people. Uh, then imagine going to school and the first thing you learn there is that you're a naughty child because the teacher just keeps on telling you off pretty much every day. Imagine living in a world where you're told that you're lazy a lot um, and you believe it but it doesn't seem to make sense because you seem to be working harder than anyone else around just to cope with normal life. Imagine having a brain that can only see about one day ahead and then everything beyond that is a bit of a fog and all you can do is try to navigate through it to goals which are just completely impossibly distant. That is what having ADHD is like. Um, and ADHD is a bit of a bad name actually because it's not mainly about attention or hyperactivity, uh, it is in fact much more about self-control uh, and the parts of your brain which deal with working memory, motivation, putting together a plan, all of those are really really that is what ADHD affects. So uh, it's a bit like being short-sighted to the future um, and as you can having uh, this is a real problem and has major effects over time. Uh, these are some of the risks that you're more likely to uh, suffer from when you are an adult with ADHD. So if you're interested in learning more, I'd really recommend uh, Professor Russell Barkley. Um, and I've put some uh, slides which are going to be sent out for some good YouTube lectures from him. So it's really really fascinating actually um, and of course a bit scary. So um, the reason that I know HD <laughs> is because my husband Francis had it and that's him on the left and me on the right back in the day um, and uh, obviously I love Francis but ADHD has been a real challenge for both of us. Um, and of course, ADHD is not the only type of neurodivergence either. So uh, I'm also this in this session going to be introducing Charlie, uh, who is my colleague Paul Stafford's son. And Paul has very generously allowed me to share Charlie's story. Uh, and there is also a blog post that Paul wrote on scrum.org, uh, which I've linked in the slides. So uh, to give you a little bit of background about Charlie, uh, he is an identical twin uh, and he is also on the autism spectrum. So Paul says that for Charlie, change is not just something that he struggles with, it's something that can turn his whole world upside down. So for instance, if you brushed his teeth before you got him to dress, he would fight, scream, cry, push you away and really become just inconsolable. So, and if uh, for some reason 
uh, Paul had to go a different route in the car, uh, then there would be um, absolutely hours to calm Charlie down from that and put him back at ease and sometimes even days and there would be a lot of anxiety next time that they needed Charlie to get back into the car. Um, and on top of that it's very common of course for children with on the autism spectrum to suffer from speech delay so for Charlie to communicate what's wrong and what's bothering him is a really difficult frustrating process sometimes. So, uh, but as with anybody who is neurodivergent, Charlie is not just his condition. Uh, he really has deep and passionate interests. And for instance, uh, by the age of four, he could tell you every single detail about the Flying Scotsman train. So, um, does Scrum come into this? Well, uh, like Dave said, I am a developer. And uh, on my very first day as a graduate developer, having taught myself to code, um, they started talking about Scrum, which is not actually anything to do with coding. <laughs> and um, I instantly realized that it could be the structure that Francis and I needed at home to uh, finally get our lives on track. So I want to give you an insight into what our lives were like at the time really better than this photo of what our kitchen looked like most of the time. Um, cleaning it like tidying and cleaning is just a really visible form of the chaos that was in our lives and of course it was my fault as well. <laughs> Both of us made the house messy but it is a real catch-22 because it was kind of either go along with it or try and do it all myself or try and nag Francis to do his part and carry all of the information about what's happen happening next and try and keep both of us organised. And I just really, really did not want to fall into the trap of becoming that person. So the kind of better option was to go for just joining him. Um, and at the time, this was sort of straight after university, both of us were in uh, dead-end part-time jobs, uh, struggling a bit, uh, but Francis in particular, because he didn't have really any enthusiasm for the future uh, at all. And he was uh, drinking too much. Uh, every night was at least a few beers, um, often more than a few. And even something like, you know, getting out there and seeing the world and traveling to amazing places, just seemed like a chore to him because it sounded like so much work to do that. Um, so I was pretty worried about like how how we go from this to our our lives together. Um, so when I got home that day on learning about Scrum, I suggested to him that we give it a go. Uh, and it really is to his credit that he allowed me to to try this because we had tried all sorts of productivity systems before and nothing had stuck for more than a week or two and that was the case throughout Francis's whole life so the fact he was willing to give this a go says something amazing about hope <laughs> and the human spirit anyway so we broke down every single task we could for how to get a board onto our wall and that is that is those notes. We cleared a tiny corner on our table. Um, and I took a photo because I just had a feeling that this might be a bit of a turning point for us. Um, and within three days, I board up after it being languishing somewhere for three years in our house. Um, and we got started. So, um, you know, we were pretty excited. It was uh, pretty smooth going for a while. We had uh, these categories for different colours of our life. Um, we had tasks in the backlog for all of those things. Um, and we even added things, games basically. So the laundry hat trick there is if you do a wash a load, hang up a load and put away a load of laundry in one day, then you get a plus three bonus uh, on, on your points. So. Um, it was going pretty well, but of course, 
anything can go for a while on the initial enthusiasm. But I'm really, really happy to report that three years later, we are still going. There have been months where we've not done it, but mostly through those three years we have. And um, we have achieved some pretty amazing things in that time for us. So first of all, Uh, having the previous, you know, largest holiday we'd ever been on was a week in Whitby, which is, <laughs> which is not, it's on the coast in England and uh, not far from Leeds where we lived. So to go from that to a month in Hong Kong and Vietnam was a bit of a major step um, and it was amazing. Um, another thing that happened, uh, which was also amazing, Was, we, was the bane of our lives to plan. Uh, but in particular for someone with ADHD, a wedding is just pretty much impossible. Uh, but with Scrum, Francis was able to contribute, uh, which was brilliant because I'm a feminist and I was, did not want to be left with the whole, all the work for it. So um, it was just really, really good that he actually could break down the work and tackle parts of it through Scrum that he has taken, he's taken up archery and woodworking. Our garden though is still a complete fright, unfortunately. Um, but he has also quit drinking and smoking, um, which was brilliant. Uh, obviously that came from his own, his own choice and decision, but Scrum really helped because we did do this thing where we had a bit of a streak going and every day he got an extra point for continuing to not smoke and not drink. Um, so Scrum is even useful for that kind of thing. Another thing we've done is uh, we spent six months with some other adults with ADHD to create a YouTube channel. And we interview people and uh, about their experiences, which was really, really fulfilling. Uh, it turned out also to be a lot of work and quite overwhelming for us. So we're hoping to circle back around onto it maybe uh in perhaps a podcast form something that's a bit more uh sustainable for us um in terms of francis's career and direction we decided that he wanted to aim for something a bit more long term which had never happened before so we started volunteering at the yorkshire ambulance service as a community first responder and this badge here means that he successfully helped to save a life through CPR and resuscitation. Um, so from being like a delivery rider and <laughs> cycling around delivering meals, this is uh, where he's got to. And I'm very happy that uh, a few months ago, he successfully finally managed to get into his dream job, basically, of being on the ambulance crew with the paramedic, um, and of course, right now, going out in uh, in this crisis and so on. Uh, and this was like basically on his first day, it was like he was going to school for the first time in his uniform. It was just really, really, we were both so happy. Um, and he's really enjoying it. It's exactly suited to him uh, because it's a very reactive and sort of, you just have to do one thing at a time and do it to the best of your abilities. So it really suits him. Um, basically about Scrum, uh, what Scrum has given Francis is a bit of a sense of stability and self-belief. So uh, Francis has compared ADHD to being a bit like lo being lost on an ocean on a raft um, and you have no idea how or where to go. Um, but having Scrum is a bit like having a compass and a paddle while you're on that raft. So it doesn't make things easy but it does give you a sense of direction and some sense that you might actually make progress when you make effort. So having never really had any sense of a long-term future or any hope for that future, uh, I can really say for both of us that it has changed our lives for him to now have that. I also want to go back to Charlie. And this is Charlie's scrum board. Um, Paul started him off with a really simple 
to do doing done column system. And uh, this was to mirror a board that Charlie's teacher set up at school. Um, and you can see all the tasks are pictures. So Charlie could move them himself uh, across. And it all like pretty much instantly had some good signs because Charlie was asking fewer questions about what he had to do that day. Uh, and that was a good sign that he was feeling less anxious. But um, unfortunately, as life does, uh, there was a change. And one day a substitute teacher was teaching at Charlie's school. Um, and that really threw Charlie off. So Paul concluded that the system was just a bit too rigid as it was, and it wasn't really going to help Charlie uh, as much as he hoped as for uh, coping with change. So the first thing he did about that uh, was to try and give Charlie faith in the board again uh, by introducing cycle goals. So this is a picture of the back of those laminated cards. And once Charlie had completed all of them, he could build a picture. And these pictures were tailored by Paul to be uh, things which Charlie is really interested in. So uh, the only issue with this one was that uh, Charlie complained that this picture did not show the scaffolding that Big Ben was currently under at the time. <laughs> um, so another thing is that Paul and his wife started having small retrospectives with Charlie. So that meant sitting down and talking about what he did and didn't like about the board. Um, so that allowed a bit of a feedback loop and a bit of a chance to start tailoring it more and more to what Charlie needed. So the next thing that Paul and his wife tried was this question mark card. Um, and it, it, the point of it is to be a thing that's unknown in the day that's going to happen. Uh, and they kept this really positive at first by, uh, for instance, offering Charlie the choice of using that card to go to the shop and get some sweets or have some extra game time on his Nintendo. Um, so after that, the next step was to begin introducing things in a different order. So trying like brushing his teeth before getting dressed and that could be represented on the board, you know, by what things went first. Um, and, but at the end of the day, Charlie was still able to build his whole picture. So he could see how the tasks, even if they were done differently, all led to the same thing. Um, the effect of this has been really, really successful because it has really helped Charlie to become more flexible. And um, there was a there was a particular instance which highlighted this for Paul, which was when they were driving to Grandma's house, and unfortunately they hit some roadworks, which was a really, really like trigger point for. The family they knew that this was a challenge so they had to go around the diversion and uh this could have really set charlie off but what happened was that he just looked up and asked where are we going and when paul explained he just said okay um and went back to what he was doing so it's not to say that change doesn't still upset charlie it definitely can but he's doing a whole lot better in adapting to the small day to day changes than he did before. So uh, I'm just going to finish off this presentation with a bit of a whistle stop tour on like how you can do Scrum at home yourself. Uh, and this is the part which is difficult to pitch because I'm aware that quite a few people are probably Scrum uh, already work in Scrum, but just in case. So. A, the place to start is to put up a board somewhere, some kind of thing. It can be on the fridge like this one is. And to do doing done is a great start on what columns to put. And um, then uh, there are certain ceremonies which are part of Scrum. And I would highlight a couple. So you don't have to do all of them main one is called the daily scrum 
and that is as you would expect every day uh, you stand by the board with your team and you look at what you've done uh, that day and what you're planning to do the next day and move stuff around the board and uh, discuss if there's any problems um, then the uh, that I would say is called the retrospective and that's not every day that's only maybe once a week or every fortnight um, and the retro as you uh, can call it is for making sure you discuss what you want to improve and it can be really really vital because uh, we've in the past Francis and I have skipped the retro and then found ourselves arguing a few days later about a thing which we would probably have covered if we had just spent 10 minutes talking about it at the time um so uh it doesn't seem that important but it always is Finally, the third one would be the planning meeting which is as you might expect uh just sort of a larger chance to make sure you've got all the tasks down and looked at the calendar and maybe doing that weekly or fortnightly also works well so uh those are the bits i'd highlight out of like the full scrum experience that uh, important to do. Some optional bits and pieces to make it more fun um, can be this thing called a burn down chart. Well, we, we decided burning down was boring. We wanted a burn up chart. <laughs> and we made it out of a couple of pizza boxes. <laughs> and it's still going strong three years later. So uh, basically, we just like a thermometer sort of add up how many points we've got every day. Um, and move it up uh, and see the red going up. But perhaps you could use something like marbles um, and move it across to a different pot. Uh, or even we've done a really quite crazy detailed uh, game where the orange and purple people were me and Francis and <laughs> we had to earn a certain amount of points to move up the path to the next place and there were these cards you know that would knock us back down again if we didn't earn certain points it was great it turned out to be a lot of work after we'd done it once that we didn't quite have the motivation to keep it running for really long term but that's the kind of level you can go to if you want to and you enjoy it um this is an example of a border health set up at my friend's house uh, so it's quite a nice mix of being, I don't know, not too complicated to start with. Uh, you can see on there, there's a section called regulars, which I would recommend in real life because that's for tasks which, which repeat. And in software, normally you don't have that many which keep on going repetitively, but in housework, you really do. So, so we've, uh, that was quite a, uh, a modification which we put in quite quickly. Uh, and I'd recommend. Little tweak, which is really simple, is to include some kind of calendar we found really useful. Uh, I mean, it can be really basic like this that was uh, just to give us a visual on where we were at. Um, and in general, the whole thing about Agile and Scrum in general is to inspect and adapt. So you just keep on changing your system to suit you better. So for us, that meant eventually. We had over the years. So I put together. a sort of contain all of those instructions on a crib sheet way uh, if you'd like to try it at home uh, we'll be sending out the link so that you can get that uh, at the end and uh, the other thing is I have a bit of an ambition with this to hopefully uh, write a book or at least start getting the information out there about scrum because I had never heard of it apart from when I joined the tech industry um, so I think there's a huge opportunity to spread the word about that it's not it's anything to do with coding, it's just a, a framework for helping with, with a team getting their act together, which is life basically. So um, 
yeah, I'm looking to try and write this book. And if anyone uh, does try using Scrum at home for this kind of thing, I would really, really um, benefit from your feedback and your stories about it and case studies, basically. So if you would like to help with that, then uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, these are like the email address I use for this. And there's also this thing called a Slack group uh, where other people who have already started trying to do this, um, it's a bit like a forum and a little bit like WhatsApp. So it's just a good messaging service for sharing how you're doing and getting some support. So it would be great if people could join that Slack group uh, just to keep in touch. Uh, and that handout is also available on that URL. So uh, yeah, this would be the slide to screenshot if you, if you want. Um, and thank you very, very much for listening. Uh, it's been awesome. Thank you so much, Sally. Thanks everybody for we've got we've got a bunch of questions, a lot going a lot going on. Um, that was awesome. I, I really enjoyed it. I definitely picked up a few things. One thing it sort of reminded me of, and because we've tried a few of these things at, at home after I, I read the piece that Steve wrote in October 2018. We started doing some of these things. One thing that we've had a challenge with, and and that's sort of like a little bit of a, some of the other questions is around discipline. You've, mm. it, it, you've definitely demonstrated a level of discipline that, that can be challenging. You mentioned that sometimes you've sort of swayed from the course, as I'm sure uh -huh. all Scrum teams do. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you, uh, you and Francis have managed to stay so disciplined about this? Absolutely, yeah, because I think I was taught when I first learned about this, that Scrum is really simple and really hard because the hard bit is the discipline. And um, the trouble is you have to do it every day or else it's just a board on the wall that isn't really helping you. So um, to start with, we, I think what helped us is that we definitely needed it. So we were both aware that it was really quite important. Um, and we had a system where if we'd gone one day without it, we, we said it was an orange alert. And then if it was two days, it was like, red alert, red alert, got to get back on it. Um, so we actually kept it going really consistently for at least a year, which was impressive. Um, but after things like going away for a month, uh, it did take a while to pick back up again. And I must admit that I've done a couple of times a kind of big board switch around and it's slightly <laughs> got rid of some of the good things that I could have kept. So it stopped us for a while. Um, so once Francis had got his new job, we stopped for the longest time yet, which was several months, um, partly because we'd sort of achieved that main big goal that we had started trying with trying to get to. Um, but we are now just a few weeks ago, got back into it uh, because we've still got things to do. The house is still needing a whole redecoration and stuff. Um, so it does ebb and flow. Uh, discipline, we started doing a streak for actually doing our daily scrum every day, which mm. meant that if we if we didn't miss it for a day, we have to miss our streak. So that helps as well with motivation. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's good. Yeah, the, uh, the Fitbit winning streak. You've done mm. the steps kind of thing, which is cool. I love the orange and red alert. Uh, I, I would love to in introduce that in my house. So we have a really good question from um, uh, from one of our um, viewers. Uh, from your story, it's clear you facilitated this whole process. So uh, given I have, this is the person that's asking the question, ADHD, how do I get my mm -hmm. wife to really get into this? And obviously, <laughs> you know, it's a busy family and everything. How mm -hmm. can, how, 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 you know, any words of wisdom to, to uh, uh, Anthony on this? Um, how can yeah. get the rest of the family bought into this process? So the, um, the thing about, yeah, the thing about this is that it does take quite a lot of effort from at least one person to sort of set it up and keep it going. And in my house, that is me, definitely. And Francis fully admits that he wouldn't be able to keep it going just by himself. Um, and I think the part that makes Scrum different is that it is not just a productivity system that you do by yourself. So the hardest part of it really is to 
convince another person to join you with it and to try it. But for me, the reason why I was up for that is because um, even though it's effort for me and I you know, could live without it myself, uh, it actually really um, is a much better alternative to trying to keep track of everything in a, in a less official way. So uh, there's a thing called mental load, which I think is a really good analogy, uh, where usually one person in a family is holding most of the information in their heads and managing everyone else. Um, and it can be a really invisible and hard thing to do. But this, like Scrum, lets me put that mental load actually physically onto a visual area. <laughs> and it makes it a lot more neutral so that both of us can put stuff there. Both of us can sort of be directed by the board rather than me being the nagging one and Francis being the one who gets nagged. So it's just worth it for us. I think it's not worth it for everybody because it is a lot of effort, but it's for this situation where um, if you do have an extra problem or an extra challenge, like uh, someone who's neurodivergent and struggling, then it's worth it and it, it really makes a difference. So you don't mind so much putting in the, the effort in doing it. Yeah, it's interesting. So uh, one, if you've got a lot of pain, you'll try anything <laughs> perhaps. And yeah, so exactly. that's a great motivator for bringing this to the family. Secondly, do, some, do a little something um you know don't don't necessarily try everything just slowly introduce some of these ideas and test it for a couple of weeks and see if it works uh thirdly obviously this webinar anthony uh, you share it with your wife and, uh, and family and see if they're see if they uh see if they uh, think it's it's valuable yeah that was great now um there's obviously lots of comments about empiricism at its best. Um, there's a few of those that sort of like say, this is a great example of how empirical process works, which is, which, which is, which is good. Um, how do you, uh, what actually was an interesting point that was raised um, uh, around it's, how do you make it not just about doing stuff you know like how do you broaden it so and i guess it's the example positive things like planning a holiday or a wedding it's not just like cleaning the toilet right right mm -hmm. sally do, do you think about that in terms of the, the things that are on the board yeah because we've got these uh regulars we do have a lot of things that are just like you know uh wash up put the bins out that kind of thing but it, it, it's true, it's not particularly inspiring if that's the only thing on your on your system. Um, and it was much more like above and beyond that was the sense of getting to a long term goal. So for getting Francis started with his, his career, uh, it was a lot more. We've, we just kind of divide everything into regulars and non regulars. And we even started sort of thinking about it in that game that we made as like being um, the standard of standards was sort of for the regular things, but the like sort of ambition was for trying to get a project done that was a more non-regular thing. So a bit more of a, you know, a goal uh, that's only going to happen once. So <laughs> the whole thing sort of naturally divided into those areas. And I would definitely have both because otherwise it is a bit a bit of a grind to just be looking at housework and, and normal <laughs> job. And, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I, I know the feeling. Tony's got a great question about the uh, a question around uh, the, the sprints. How long are they? You say weekly or fortnightly. Was did you explicitly make a decision about that? Obviously, in Scrum, we say the more complex, the shorter the sprint. Um, but, you know, as a general rule, uh, rule. But uh, did you? I mean, is that sort of like the time frame, weekly or fortnightly? Or every two weeks, by the way, for the international listeners. Um, uh -huh. Yes. Um, well, actually, for the first year or two, we went with fortnightly sprints, um, mainly because that was what I was doing at work. Uh, but then eventually in one of the retros, we thought, well, actually, you know, I don't know, life just sort of runs on a bit more of a weekly basis for us. So uh, plus, Francis never enjoyed doing the uh, sprint planning or the retrospective because it's just boring. <laughs> So even though he knows he needs to, it was always a bit of a, you know, struggle to sit down and do that. And we decided maybe doing it weekly meant that it could be shorter 
and just literally like a little little five ten minute planning session to mm. set us up for the next week ahead so that it was a bit less painful to to do it yeah we like yeah i yeah we've tried yeah i like the weekly i think because of the natural cadence to the week sunday is a great mm. day for planning you know um it seems to, to make a lot of sense um uh liz is having some issues with the short url i assume if she joins the ah. slack group or the um or emails you uh you can send her the long url for the uh yes. for the long URLs are also in the slide oh, okay. uh, description as well so yes i'll definitely you might need to put https colon slash slash at the start that might do it but yeah uh, we'll, we'll make sure they're posted dave in the final report i'm, I'm mm -hmm. getting an, an issue with them as well so we'll make sure the final recording has the the full urls uh, that voice from the ether was eric neighberg our uh, coo who's always uh, always available to solve any i he, he his voice appears at any time whenever i have any issues so uh, you should uh, you get one. Uh, there was a question around uh, estimation. Did you do estimation? Did you estimate oh, yeah. the sort of like tasks and stuff? And the, I guess this comes to the points as well. Talk a little bit about that, Sally. That would be really, really useful. Yes, I forgot to say properly about these points. Um, so basically, every every task gets its own scrap of paper or post-it note. Um, and when we write something down, we decided the easiest way to estimate was right then and there. When you're writing it down, you put a number and we don't do a big long kind of meeting where we sort of try and estimate really formally. We just trust each other to write down a number that is relatively sane for the effort required for that thing. So for people who've never estimated anything, it's just a sort of very relative number based on how hard something feels like it's going to be. Um, and for us, that became a really like motivational part of the system. So normally that's just done so that you can kind of predict how how many tasks you can fit in a sprint. But for us, it was done so that we could see how many points we had achieved each day and each, each sprint and then see if we had like made progress or we could move forward in the game or whatever. So the points were weirdly motivating, even though they weren't connected with any kind of real reward they were just sort of a, a good way of seeing how much we'd actually done yeah it's awesome and uh, i like the idea of moving up the, the sort of burn up or whatever uh, sort of model mm. which is fantastic there's a question you you do do dailies right you have a daily mm. scrum um uh, and um that's one of that's it you you called that out as a key event mm. uh, is that talk a little bit about um, I assume it's relatively short and not that stressful right <laughs> is that right yeah <laughs> yeah it's very um it's very low-key it was one of the reasons actually why we didn't do the game like a second time because it really lengthened our daily scrum to move ourselves along and pick up the cards and all sorts but uh now we've kept it down to just we move our we move the tasks that we've done into the done column we count them all up, we stick them on the burn-up chart, and then we just kind of reset the board into pushing what we're going to do tomorrow into like the to-do column. So that's all there is to it, basically, for us. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to face when it's sort of bedtime and you need to do it really quickly so that you can just go to sleep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, that, that's great. And then one of the one of the events that you called out was the sprint review. Uh, mm. How do you do that at home? I mean, I, I know how it works at Scrum.org. It's it's quite an intense event because we're talking about how we did. We're being very, dare I say, vulnerable about the, the, mm. the things we didn't do, which are always a lot more painful than the things we did do. Um, it, how does that work at, in the home, Sally? yeah so the retrospective um it's it's at the most simple sometimes all we do is just ask ourselves okay what went well and what didn't go well um but in fact because we're married like it's also a good opportunity to be vulnerable with each other and for a while we did it just by writing letters to each other for like 10 minutes and then reading what each other had to say which was also really useful so um it's a surprisingly valuable part of it in terms of clearing the air and making sure you're communicating um and even the daily scrum gives you just that chance to be like oh what did you do today and i sort of appreciated more all the things which francis was doing to tidy the house and clean and so on that i often like couples don't 
really know what the other person is putting into the household and they can underestimate the effort that the other one's putting in which can be a big source of conflict so uh it just gives you a more accurate picture of of actually how you're both pulling together that's awesome uh, and then there's a question around the reward system i think this is more aimed at you know uh with the ex example of charlie really it, mm -hmm. do, do, do they does do they use a reward system? Um, does Paul use a, re, 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 a reward system with Charlie, uh, and can that lead to sort of bad behaviour? You know, sort of like mm -hmm. dare I say a dependency, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, what you know, I, I know personally, we've had some challenges with reward systems that we end up having to give so much. My ah. my my eldest is uh, surprisingly smarter <laughs> at managing the rewards than I am in terms of managing the the levels. So to, um, do you know have much information around rewards and whether it's a good idea or whether it can lead to some you know bad outcomes, particularly for kids? Well, uh, I don't have kids, and I'm actually not sure whether Paul has tried that with Charlie, uh, but I do have some thoughts because. I think it is a challenge, obviously, because you want to keep the motivation fairly intrinsic to the system. Mm. And for us, that just sort of works out in terms of finding the points themselves quite motivating. Uh, but for children, it could be a bit more like you need sort of their buy in and they might not be so thrilled with, with their parents, like telling them they're going to do the system. Uh, so I'm not sure. I would say that the thing about dependence is really interesting because um, it's for, at least with ADHD it's uh, something that is treated with medication really effectively but also uh, the other whole half of, a, of the treatment is about the environment that a person is in so this um, this system kind of should be seen as something that a person is dependent on because uh, mm. it's never going to be a, a need that they don't have you know so it's sort of like uh, I think both Francis and I see it as possibly a lifelong endeavour of like uh, keeping it going in some form or another uh, to help us. And it's weird to, I don't know, think of an environmental thing like that. But on the other hand, if it was a physical disability, you would see like adding a ramp to a house as being perfectly obvious, you know. So uh, I've called this, you know, my talks in the past. A wheelchair ramps for the mind because uh, <laughs> yeah, you scrum is kind of that yeah I completely yes and yes that's actually a really good analogy not and you you need those ramps once in a while that that that's great the 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 the, the last question um we come to the end of the questions as one and then I have a, a final thing in a large family with strong personalities is Teresa asking this how did the allocation of work happen uh, do, do you have any example you know nobody wants to clean the toilet do they I mean not that, <laughs> that necessarily is up there I actually kind of like cleaning toilets by the way just as a as a slight <laughs> aside because you actually finish it which I really like but the um and then it's clean but did you have a problems with that is it like a, a team thing what talk a little bit about that Sally if you've got a moment yeah so um <laughs> a really good question um for a while for actually like nearly two years it was me earning the money and francis at home so we had quite a good way of splitting it in terms of <laughs> francis did the housework and i did the other bits so uh it's actually been quite a readjustment now that he has his own job uh for me to step up and do my part actually <laughs> And it's such a weird what role reversal that now he's the one who is more on top of the housework uh, but anyway, uh, I think for deciding who has to do the jobs which people don't want to do, I think even even then Scrum could help because um, you've got that task on a piece of paper physically there. And so you, it's much easier to share it and to move it around to like maybe maybe everyone has their own row on the board and you move it down to the next person's row once you've done it so that it's a bit fairer um but yeah splitting work in a family is always going to be contentious i just think that hopefully 
having it on a board is a little bit more neutral and a bit more like you can actually discuss it uh, in a in a more objective way. So it's not just parents telling kids to do something or, you know, uh, partner nagging the other partner. Yeah, 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 makes it, uh, you described it as neutral. I thought that was a really interesting word because you've put it on the on the board, it's become neutral and and that sort of like takes the, uh, the personal stuff out of it. Mm -hmm. as it were which is which is which is really 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 good there was one comment about isn't this just a kanban and uh, I, i'll actually yeah. take that for a minute i i don't think it really matters yeah. <laughs> i just think <laughs> Drum or whether it's Kanban. The, the one things that obviously native Kanban doesn't have are those events that you talked about. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think that's sort of super interesting. The value of the retro, the value of planning, the value of the daily sort of like adds something that I don't think you would get by just visualizing. And obviously the concept of a sprint as well, that I, you could argue that that's just a whip, uh, minimizing work in progress. And that's also, uh, you know, that's true as well. They, the two worlds do over, over, overlap yeah. in regards to that. But uh, I must, I don't, yeah, I think. I must an, admit that we, we do allow new work to come in during a sprint, <gasps> which I, I know oh. is terrible, but, no, it's <laughs> but we do not. also, <laughs> we do also uh sort of split the board by you know just this week what we're trying to get done and it helps a lot to break it down to that level and not have every single task all in that box you know just a few tasks in that box that you can yeah, see yeah, yourself yeah. moving across so yeah, yeah. it and is a bit way, handy, but yeah which is which is fine and i have no problem with that i we're not religious here at, at scrum.org but what's interesting is work can come into a sprint there's no problem the only reason why you would ever question it is if, does it undermine the sprint goal and i i assume that's true also of the uh of the situation at home if sort of like suddenly this like oh my god the storm hit the shed mm. fell down brand new bit of work that we need to sort out well then the goal for the, we were going to you know spend this week planning the wedding i'm just making this mm -hmm. up we're not going to be able to do as much you make a choice right mm -hmm. that's all the um that, that that's all scrum would tell you it doesn't uh unfortunately it makes those choices very visible which is uh mm -hmm. which people particularly managers don't necessarily always like um mm -hmm. which is always interesting um okay well we're sort of out of time now uh, and we've, you know, the, we're out of questions. So thank you ever so, um, Sally. That was awesome. And I guess, uh, you know, Paul, Francis, and Charlie. Though you're not here, I hopefully they don't mind being the subject or the example, the case study to help to share these these ideas. I'd like to thank them, even though obviously they're not here. And Paul um, uh, would have been here, but unfortunately had a quite a, a nasty uh, accident that has stopped him from being here though he is fine now so um i'd like to just thank you and thank you for thank you for helping me and helping my family and um and really making a difference which i think in these times of certainly level of complexity that's way beyond anything that we've we've ever seen before mm -hmm. and unknown more so having just some things that you can that can help uh, are fantastic and uh, ladies and gentlemen who are watching, obviously you've got the links there. We've left those links up and uh, you'll obviously get access to the presentation and the recording where those links will be be part. Um, yeah, go join that Slack group, send those emails, you know, tweet, whatever. I think this is incredibly valuable stuff. If we can help just one family be a little bit happier, then I think this has been mm -hmm. a massive success. Thank you, Sally, and uh, stay healthy. And, and thank you so much for spending the time with us all today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And thank you, everybody who came. That was, it's been really awesome.